Hello and welcome back to English 332. Uh, today, talking about uh, Chapter 16, Creating Visuals and Data Displays. Uh, we're talking about uh, how to create them, when to use them, how to be ethical with them, uh, how to integrate them. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. I, I love working with uh, graphics, tables, uh, photographs, images of all sorts. Uh, I think it's a really important aspect of communicating in the workplace, business communication, so I'm glad that uh, we'll be covering this. Uh, so anyway, hopefully you'll enjoy this, so uh, let's get into it. So here we go with our learning objectives for Chapter 16, and this time there are only four of them. Uh, we'll be talking about when to use visuals and data displays, how to create effective ones, and we'll be talking about how to integrate visuals and the data displays into text, and then finally, the various conventions that are out there for different kinds of visuals, uh, charts and graphics, as well as uh, data displays, websites, and, and so on. So it's pretty good stuff. I think we will enjoy this and get a lot out of it. All right, first off, uh, why bother with visuals? Why bother with data displays? Why can't everything just be in the form of text? And you're probably thinking already, well, sometimes just seeing a table full of numbers, a bunch of statistics, doesn't really communicate very well. Uh, it just seems too abstract. Sometimes you can't even make much sense of it. Uh, if you can put it in the form of a visual, a lot of times it's just more meaningful. You can actually understand uh, what's going on. You can see a pattern or a trend uh, on a line graph, for example, that might be hard to, harder to see just in, if you're just looking at that table again. Uh, supporting arguments is a persuasive function to this, a rhetorical function, if you will. <clears throat> kind of relates to this idea of it being more meaningful. Uh, if you have a pie chart and you got this thin little slice of the pie, <laughs> maybe that thin little slice is, say, a, a tax revenue versus uh, the money we get from donations, uh, support, public support. Thinking about NPR here, right? Now, I could imagine NPR using a pie chart. Uh, to try to show you how little of their money comes from the government uh, versus the public donations. Maybe they got a little corporate slice there from their corporate sponsors. Uh, but the visual impact of this uh, would help make that argument, right? Hey, they really do depend on the uh, the public uh, to support them. So, yeah, it's, a day, it's, it's just a pie chart. You probably wouldn't think about that being uh, persuasive per se, but it certainly can be uh, depending on how that's deployed. Uh, helping to communicate points. Uh, this one seems, again, very uh, related to this idea of it being meaningful. Uh, and then, of course, just to enhance an oral presentation. Other times you have kind of a dry topic you're discussing, sales figures, uh, <laughs> uh, stock market data, healthcare information, whatever. It, it might not be the most uh, exciting stuff, but if you can have really uh, well done visuals, really nice charts and graphs. Uh, it makes it more visual appealing, and, and I think anytime something's more enjoyable, uh, it's easier to pay attention to it, and we end up learning more from it. So, uh, for all these reasons, it's important. All right, so the point they're trying to drive home here is that you shouldn't just use your visuals and data displays for decoration. Uh, you're on PowerPoint, it's always tempting to bring in the, the clip art, the little fireworks, <laughs> uh, you know, the little, the little pencil, uh, whatever it is that you might be tempted to put on there. Uh, the book cautions you not to do it unless it, again, serves some kind of purpose. And uh, what are the purposes uh, that you might use? And of course, in the real world, the I guess in the website, it wouldn't be such a big deal. But if, if you're uh, publishing a book or brochure or pamphlet, it's going to cost more money uh, to have that picture on there. Uh, usually just the text is the cheapest option. Uh, so you have to make a case as to why the uh, visual or data display is important. And even if you are just using PowerPoint, you know, it does take some time to put the data into the chart. And so there's a little bit of a time investment there. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully it should be obvious that you need some kind of purpose to, that you'd even bother with this. Uh, they talk about presenting the ideas uh, completely Again, come, kind of coming back to that idea of it being more meaningful, being understandable. Uh, you could say, if I don't, if I leave off the chart, if I don't put it, if I leave off the graphic or the photo, whatever it is, they won't be able to fully grasp uh, the idea I'm trying to get across there. Uh, another 
uh, interesting one, I think, is finding relationships. Uh, so a lot of times nowadays we're, we're sort of inundated with data. Uh, you might have a, a database there that you've collected on all your clients and customers. And there might just be so much data there you can't possibly uh, manage it all. It's just uh, <laughs> information overload, right? Uh, but you can use a computer to start making some charts. And I talked about some of these charts have uh, multiple lines going on. And you might be able to track a couple of different uh, variables and see that, hey, there's, you know, these two factors seem to kind of go along. Uh, you know, every time there's a dip in this one, there's a dip in that one and uh, vice versa. So you might be able to find some relationships that way that you didn't even know existed. And then, of course, you could think of also about like Facebook charts of the uh, or charts where they're showing you how people are connected to each other, you know, and you might find that there's, you know, one of your, <laughs> one of your employees maybe has a, a big web of connections, and then you got all these other folks that just have maybe one link uh, to them, that, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, you could find problems, problems with communication uh, structures that way, or just find out who's able to uh, disseminate information. Uh, let's see, making points vivid. Again, you know this, uh, bright colors, uh, nicely formatted charts, <laughs> graphs. You know, some people take it to a high level and they really get, uh, they just they just love making charts. Uh, I've known plenty of students that really, they just enjoy it. Uh, and they get really good at it, you know, and they can make a table that just looks absolutely professional. And it's uh, really eye-catching and just kind of uplifts the whole uh uh, their whole report, just those really nice <laughs> tables and charts. But, you know, of course, it's not all just about looking good, but uh, looking vivid, you know, bringing it alive. Of course, emphasizing material. Usually, if you're looking at a page from your textbook, let's say, and, you know, it's just text, 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 but then maybe there's a nice little graphic there somewhere. Uh, when you get to this, probably what you're going to do when you get to this page, right, is look at that graphic there first and you're going to look and see what is that oh what is it says there it's a little caption there let me read that little caption <laughs> uh, so you're just kind of focused in on that one little part of the page uh, it's really emphasizing it uh, since there's a visual there that emphasizes the material there uh, so sometimes you'll see that in a pamphlet or brochure they'll actually put the most important information into these side cells i notice in our textbook for um, uh, this class, they tend to do this. They'll have these little little sidebars uh, with a picture and then some text that goes along with it. And usually these are stories where they're uh, showing you how the information in the chapter is applied in, in the real world. Right? So sort of real life examples of the lessons uh, taught in the textbook. And just kind of as an experiment, I went through and just didn't even read anything else in the chapter. I just looked at these uh, sidebars. <laughs> And uh, sure enough, uh, when I was done, I felt like I had read the most important parts of the chapter, right? Or at least uh, I sort of grokked the main ideas in a, in, a, in a good way. Of course, I went back later and read the, read the rest of it. But these little sidebars here, uh, I think you can make a pretty good case that that was the most important part of the chapter. And they were emphasized uh, by the way they were formatted with the visuals and being uh, offset. And then let's see what we have here. Present material concisely <laughs> with less repetition. Now, I'll tell you the place I've seen this, and I'll never forget this. I had a job one summer as a temp, temp agent, and I was, I was a really good typer, typist. I, mean, I could type something like 100 words per minute uh, with zero errors. That was what I was tested at at one point. So naturally, I was getting all these <laughs> data entry positions. Uh, hideously boring, but hey, I was, uh, you know... Still in college, I was good, glad to have the work. Uh, but anyway, one of these uh, jobs was uh, typing in. They had all these paper copies. This was back when they were making this transition from uh, everything being paper-based to um, uh, electronic digital stuff. And, uh, one of them was this collection of survey of surveying uh, documents related to property. Uh, so the, you've probably seen these surveyors off on the side of the road sometimes. Uh, they'll be... Uh, surveying something, they'll have a little telescope looking device, <laughs> sometimes it looks like binoculars, and uh, they're getting all these angles and everything, figuring out, well, there's a little hill there on that spot, uh, so they have to talk about how, <laughs> you know, how much, how tall is this hill, and uh, where is it in 
in correlation to the rest of the property. So you might have a you know some weird sort of property like this. And so they got to describe all this and the different features on it uh, down to like uh, feet and inches and degrees. Uh, so they write these reports and the reports are just, I mean, it's just nothing but it just reads like gibberish to somebody that's not a professional. It'd be like 12 feet to the north at you know, 12 degrees and <laughs> elevation of such and such. Uh, and then it's just that over and over and over and over. Just you would not want to read this. <laughs> <laughs> if you tried reading this out loud, you'd be asleep by about the third sentence. Uh, so it's it really takes a lot. Maybe this is even even like a little small plot. You know, needs a big lengthy set of paragraphs to really describe all this uh, survey data uh, accurately. And of course, they could uh, if they didn't have to write out all this text. Everything had to be in the form of text and numbers, right? It'd been so much easier just to have some uh, some kind of uh, photographs there. Uh, all this 3D technology now, they could they could probably have this map scanned in somehow, and you could spin it and look at the uh, terrain features very uh, exactly that way. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the point I think is that uh, the the visuals would make this infinitely more concise. I mean, these pages of pages of uh, 12 degrees, five <laughs> feet, blah blah blah. <laughs> You know, that could all be, it's all basically just describing a couple of photographs. So that's just some, some ideas there about how this, these images can make things more concise. Now let's see what we have there. Every visual should tell a story. And that seems to be one of the. All right, so here are the steps we'll be following. We'll talk more about each one of these in a minute. Uh, but the first step is to check the quality uh, of the data. If you don't have good data, <laughs> what's the point of putting it into a good chart? Kind of a waste of a chart. Uh, determining the story you want to tell. Uh, choosing the visual that fits that story. Knowing and following the conventions, uh, whatever those may be for that circumstance. Uh, being restrained, oh, let's see, uh, use color and decoration with restraint. Uh, so not getting carried away, not getting uh, flamboyant with this stuff, just using it uh, where it needs to be used, not just frivolously. Uh, and, of course, being accurate and uh, ethical. I probably would put number six at the top of this list, but <laughs> here it is. <laughs> All right, so let's get into these steps. Now, first, checking the quality of the data. Uh, you could find data to support just about any claim uh, that you want, right? Uh, if you get on the internet, you can find people that uh, can make a pretty convincing case that the earth is flat. <laughs> uh, you know, you read, you think that's ridiculous, you know, but uh, the way they, they, they're able to do all these, uh, present their data, <laughs> and uh, how reliable is the data? Well, uh, probably not too reliable. Uh, I don't know how they come to their conclusions. And but anyway, looking at where the data comes from, and you know, a while back I asked everybody to look at a, a page about these um, mattresses that use electromagnetism, and it was complete bogus uh, pseudoscience. Uh, that that site, it's uh, you know, it's not backed up by any kind of real science. It's not a reliable source, and the way you could tell that is because they <laughs> they're selling these blankets. <laughs> Uh, so you kind of kind of question that. Uh, well, if you're selling the product, maybe you're not going to uh, state the stuff that makes your product look like pseudoscience, right? You're just going to stick to stuff that supports your product. Uh, uh, so that should have been a, a yellow flag, right? A caution. Uh, but any kind of uh, data you find, you you want to look see where does it come from? Is it was it compiled by a, a, some type of uh, uh, organization that's biased you know it's uh, the council to end <laughs> smoking <laughs> well of course they're not going to tell you anything that might question that uh, smoking is unhealthy for you all right uh, so anyway checking where the data comes from uh, check that you have data for all the factors uh, that you should consider uh, so with this uh, some of the uh, pro smokers right the people that think that smoking uh, is good or <laughs> not at least not as bad as they uh, say they'll say look you know we look at these other factors look at the age uh, of the people who are 
uh, dying from a uh, lung cancer let's say let's, let's think about genetic factors <laughs> you know they try to kind of uh blow some uh, some smoke there i guess and say look there could be a lot of other stuff out there that explains uh the uh the cancer besides uh the, the cigarettes and the, and the nicotine or whatever um, anyway the point is just have you have you considered that have you looked at the factors that will probably come up uh, that people will question Let's see, do not use visuals of unreliable data. Why are you even using uh, unreliable data? Uh, I don't know. I think that should, shouldn't even be a problem, but uh, certainly if you aren't sure about your data, uh, again, you, you definitely wouldn't want to put it into a visual because then you're emphasizing it and it's really going to draw a lot of attention to it. And that could probably get you, you know, if, if there is something unethical about it, uh, that's just going to compound it tenfold. So, again, making sure your data is reliable and then thinking about other factors and not using, definitely don't put it into a visual if you can't trust it. All right, the story that you want to tell. Uh, what, what are these uh, stories? Uh, they talk about supporting a hunch uh, that you have. All right, so you could look at Maybe your hunch is that students that bring laptops or students that uh, have their own uh, uh, laptops, maybe you think they, they probably do better in school. Let's just say <laughs> that's your hunch. Uh, you have better grades if you have a laptop. Uh, well, you could use the, that could be your story, right? And you could see how you could use all kinds of display data graphs uh, that would back that up. Uh, surprise or challenge knowledge. All right, so again, thinking about Kind of what we talked about before with the hook. If you want to uh, get people's attention, it's it's one of the best ways to do that is, is to challenge something that seems to be common sense, right? Well, did you know that blah, blah, blah? Uh, this is probably my favorite one. This third one here. Uh, showing unexpected trends or changes. And this one's really exciting. We kind of got into it a little bit uh, before about the... Uh, all these sites like Facebook and Google and all their data analytics. And there is a scary side to it. But on the other hand, it, it is really interesting, uh, some of the trends that a human being couldn't sift through all this data. Uh, even if they had 100 years, they couldn't get through it all, uh, much less identify any kind of patterns to it. But the computers are able to find, uh, they, they can, you know, they can look at just enormous, enormous piles of uh, of data and come back with saying, look, you know, most people that, uh, you know, if you if you have a hamburger on Monday, you'll be more likely to pay your bills on Tuesday. You know, just just weird uh, stuff like that uh, that can emerge uh, from this data. But of course, the only way we're going to be able to see this as humans, <laughs> we're not robots, we're not computers. And the only way we can see it is if it's put into the form of uh, the, uh, uh, visuals, right? Graphs, um, tables. Well, let's see, having commercial or social significance. Uh, I guess, we, again, we could think about the, the Facebook or <laughs> Google, all this stuff. Uh, one of the things I think a lot about is this, uh, uh, what do they call it, the net neutrality. Uh, so you keep hearing about net neutrality, and it just sounds so hide hideously boring that everybody just kind of tunes out. They don't listen to that. Uh, whereas uh, those people could... Uh, if they did use visuals in a clever way, they might be able to get more attention on it to emphasize, look, this is going to have an impact on commerce and on uh, the way you interact with people. Uh, again, people would be more likely to tune in if they see a visual than if they just see a bunch of text. Uh, providing information uh, needed for action. Uh, probably the place I see that would be what I think about here is the airlines. I know I've probably mentioned this too many times already, but <laughs> when you board a plane, you don't really have much to do uh, when you first sit down there and you're listening to the uh, uh, attendants talk about their safe, safety issues. And they'll say, pull out the brochure. And you look at this brochure thing, this pamphlet, and it, it's basically in the form of a comic book, really. It has like, uh, if the oxygen masks come down, what do you do? And they have pictures there to show you how to do that. And I always thought uh, it's really nice that they do that because uh, 
you know, you can imagine being on a plane and it's jostling and uh, turbulence or whatever. You're probably scared out of your mind by the time you actually have to reach for this uh, brochure. So it's nice to just be able to look down, see the diagram, and know just by looking at it what you need to do. Um, you wouldn't be able to read a bunch of fine text, e even if you wanted to, right? You just wouldn't be able to do that. But the picture works. And let's see, this last one, be relevant to the audience. Uh, so, uh, yeah, any good story will do this, right? We don't want to read stories that have nothing to do with us. Uh, if we feel like it's not, if it's going to have zero impact, uh, we just don't even look at it. You know, I know people that if there was a big article in the newspaper about uh, the chess tournament, <laughs> uh, you're probably not even going to bother reading that unless you're uh, interested in chess, right? So they'd have to find a way to make it relevant. If they really wanted average people to read it, they'd have to find some way to make it relevant. Uh, maybe talking about how these uh, chess players are from different countries. It's kind of an international angle to it or how this, this one's at this. <laughs> maybe where there's a 10-year-old a playing, right? And that's kind of uh, intriguing to anybody, uh, even people that don't play chess. They might want to read about this sort of whiz kid. All right, determining the story you want to tell, how to find uh, the stories. Uh, to find the story, focus in on a topic. Uh, so we might, uh, maybe your reports, we talked about traffic or parking on campus, right? Maybe you could uh, zero in on that topic. Uh, simplify the data on that topic and convert number uh, to simple units. Okay, so we could be thinking about parking on campus. And what kind of data do we have? We've got X number of parking spots, uh, Y number of vehicles. Uh, let's see if we can convert this. Um, Maybe there's different times of the day. Maybe there's all sorts of stuff going on. How can we simplify it uh, to bring the story home? Uh, looking for relationships and changes. Uh, so again, thinking about the how many students commute, how many are are domiciled here on campus. Uh, this there's been a new parking garage installed. How does that change things? Uh, does it matter what time of day it is, uh, what day of the week it is, and so on and so forth? Uh, processing the data to find more stories, right? So you might go back into it again, see if you can identify some other other trends, other patterns. And it's you know, kind of lather, rinse, repeat with this stuff. Always going back to it, trying to find uh, new ways to look at it. All right, so now we get down to the nitty gritty. It's using the right visuals for the story. Lots of different kinds of visuals out there, obviously. So which, how do you know when to use which? And they start off by talking here about tables. And so use the table when the audience needs uh, to know an exact uh, value. And so I think this is a good example they've got here. Uh, children's sizes in the U.S. Uh, versus the ones in Europe. So you might be ordering some clothes from a website, I guess, based in Europe. Who knows? Or maybe you're overseas on vacation maybe, uh, trying to buy some clothes and let's say, well, my kid wears a nine US. What is that in European? Okay, 27. Uh, so it's not gonna be good to have 25 or 29. Uh, you, know, you don't want a ballpark estimate. You want to know the exact value. Uh, same thing with temperature, right? Celsius and Fahrenheit, uh, Kelvin, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff like that where it's important uh, that you have that exact value, use the table. Uh, my favorite, the pie chart, or as I like to think of them, the Pac-Man chart, uh, show parts of a whole. Right? So you got the whole budget here, the whole, uh, maybe this is your marketing budget, or maybe, maybe I got this thing here is like tuition. You know, here's uh, how your tu tuition, where your tuition goes, different areas where it goes. Uh, uh, maybe this is expenses versus uh, profits. You know, uh, <laughs> Maybe this is... Um, different parts of your CPU uh, that are or your CPU cores, you know, which one gets used <laughs> more often. Uh, the point is you're talking about something, the whole apparatus or the whole sum, the whole figure, and then uh, breaking up into parts so you can look and see the different sizes, right? So you, you can pretty, it's pretty obvious, whatever this red slice here, uh, you just look at this pie chart and you see, wow, that's a big chunk. This is the biggest chunk. It sort of has that visual impact that way. 
Now you look at these other ones and you see, well, they're all about the same. All right, so that, that's the purpose of a pie chart when you want to emphasize that kind of uh, comparison. Uh, what about the bar charts? Uh, they say those are used to compare items, uh, to show relationships. Uh, so here they've, it's kind of small, but they basically got the year broken into quarters, right? First quarter, second quarter, uh, etc. And they've got three items they're tracking there, and they've got those uh, in different colors. And when you're looking at this chart, uh, you probably look over these first couple of uh, quarters. You're like, well, okay, I see a little bit of a difference there. Uh, it climbed up a little bit. Uh, but really, well, something happened there in the third quarter. Wow, look, this gray bar jumped up. It's the biggest, it's, it's like a, <laughs> a tower, towering over these other uh, items on the chart. So you'd really, that this is what you're going to be talking about with this kind of chart, right? Because everybody's going to look over there and see that. And this is going to be the, uh, uh, what, uh, you know, your story is, right? Whatever happened there. And then the parent charts are used to, uh, to tell complex stories. Uh, so you see here they've got, uh, see, despite rising rates, they've got a yield on 30-year Treasury bond here at the, first, at the top. And at the bottom, we've got Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, so you've got the rates going up, um, industrial average uh, going up. And so you being able to visualize that, being able to see that, of course, a lot more effective. Imagine if it was just a table with like 6.35, 6.45, uh, and little tick marks by it. That would be uh, really cumbersome. And same thing with these numbers here, 6,500, 6,600. It doesn't really mean anything to me. 6,500, well, 6,800, it was 6,500. Uh, well, so, <laughs> you know, that doesn't mean I, uh, it's just my mind goes blank. I don't see anything. If I just hear those those figures, but seeing it on this chart, uh, again, it's sort of, you can see, well, yeah, that's a pretty big increase, you know, especially how it was kind of middling all this time. And then within the last couple of weeks, looks like it's soared up. And it has something to do with these rising rates of, on the 30-year <laughs> treasury bond. <laughs> so trying to explain this, probably not going to work. It put, put me to sleep or I just get confused. Uh, but putting in this visual form where I can just see what's going on, I get it. All right, now we're talking about line charts. And as you can see, these are just lines. And if you, it's kind of small on my screen, but if you look really closely, you can see they've got these little symbols that go along the line to kind of keep them separate. Uh, there's a Looks like a little blue diamond there for east and squares for west. Uh, you know, I'd probably recommend just having different colored lines, like a red and a blue and a uh, yellow line seem to be easier. But uh, sometimes you're printing this out in black and white. You might not have color as an option, so you have to do something like this uh, with these uh, little symbols, uh, just so people won't get confused. Uh, but obviously, it's, it's good for when you're looking at things over time. So they started here again with the first quarter all the way down to the fourth quarter. And you can see, I guess, east, west, north, these are probably different branch, different regions of the business. And you can see there, whoa, uh, the eastern branch really had a good third quarter. <laughs> uh, but man, did they, uh, something happened during that fourth quarter. They went right back down. Uh, whereas these other ones seem to be more stable uh, performers. Uh, showing frequency or distribution, right? So if you have a problem, maybe computer breakdowns or uh, I would think here in Minnesota, let's say you're doing uh, one of these for Minnesota and you're talking about traffic accidents. Uh, I don't think you need to be, a, you don't have to have a PhD <laughs> in uh, statistics to know, yeah, you're probably going to have a lot more uh, accidents in the winter seasons when there's lots of snow and ice. Uh, than in the other seasons, right? And you could use a line ch uh, chart like this to really show it. Uh, you'd probably have uh, very few accidents until you get to, say, uh, uh, January, <laughs> February, and then the spike would go up. Unless he's showing correlations as well. Uh, yeah, with this one, if you look here at this line graph, you can sort of see these two here, uh, the yellow one and the, and the red. They're they're not the same number numerically, but they're kind of looks like about the same angle 
of decline going on there from the second to the fourth quarter. Uh, so you can see that there might be some, some kind of correlation there. Uh, they don't, however, seem impacted by this enormous spike uh, with the eastern branch. As you could say, that didn't really seem to have any effect on these other ones. And let's see a little bit more about this. Uh, now we're talking about photographs. You know, these are always nice. A photograph really catches the eye. I mean, look at this photo. <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure what we're looking at there. It looks like maybe a CPU. Uh, I mean, a uh, you know processor board. Uh, well, I'm blanking on the name of these things. A microchip. <laughs> I guess circuit board, there we go. <laughs> uh, anyway, it really catches the eye. It looks nice. It, it's just a fun thing to have on a page, but does it serve any purpose? Uh, so they say you can use photographs to create a sense of authenticity. Uh, well, this is certainly true. Uh, when people can, if you're thinking about something like contaminants in the water, or I guess here maybe it's something to do with uh, speeds of transistors. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, showing that you have the objects there, I guess, can kind of create that sense of authenticity. I see a lot of times in a in an advertisement for a medicine, uh, they seem like they always have a picture there of the doctor, and for some reason the doctor has a traditional stethoscope on, or it's somebody peering into a microscope. <laughs> uh, they're looking at little samples, and I guess the idea there is, look, we're really scientists here. Uh, we're authentic. Uh, showing the item in use, uh, you see this in car commercials, right? You see the person driving the car around. <clears throat> I could imagine if I'm trying to sell you a, a snow thrower, and you could see me, if I had some photographs of, uh, of uh, somebody operating that snow thrower, you'd, you'd say, okay, that's how it works. <laughs> and it definitely seems more compelling than just uh, uh, a diagram might be, or a, uh, you know, especially if you're trying to sell the snow thrower. Uh, I think seeing that person operating it, big smile on their face, uh, the snow really just, whew, <laughs> you know, flying out of that thing, uh, that's going to be pretty effective. Uh, on the other hand, if the drawings, uh, this would be better for the instructions, right? Because you don't necessarily want a dramatic presentation in the instructions, you just want a very clear. Uh, diagram there, a drawing uh, showing. You know, what do I? What button do I push? Uh, what? <laughs> how do I start this thing? <laughs> how do I adjust the uh, the flume on it? All right, let's see. Drawings to show dimensions and to emphasize detail. Uh, the nice thing about a drawing is you don't have to put everything in there. So, like this photograph of the guy uh, with the snow thrower. You got trees in there. You might have a little dog running around somewhere. Uh, you know, telegraph or telephone pole, all this stuff that really doesn't serve any purpose, just happened to be there in the scene uh, when you snap the the photo. Uh, with a drawing, though, you can leave all that out. Like this house, for example, they don't have the little, they don't have the roof tiled, uh, they don't have the bushes out in front, and stuff that doesn't really matter for uh, the purpose of this um, uh, blueprint, right? So you leave all that out. Uh, same thing with the comics and cartoons, like the the one we're talking about with the uh, the airplane and the safety procedures, right? You don't have to draw in uh, the little kid screaming <laughs> in the seat in front of uh, the person. <laughs> uh, you can just leave all that out and just uh, draw the parts they need to know to be able to, you know, put on the uh, oxygen mask. And then we, let's see what, uh, yeah, maps. Uh, use maps. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm sure you never would have been able to figure this one out. Uh, but you can use maps to emphasize location. Uh, so here we have a nice map. And this is something that I think has really taken off really in the past few, I guess probably about a decade now. I'm not really sure when Google Maps uh, got to be a thing. Um, there was something else before that. I'm blanking on the name of it. Uh, there was some other map program. But anyway... Uh, Google Maps, it's just really, really easy to, uh, if you want to show something happening in St. Cloud or Minnesota, you can just bring up that map and it lets you put in your pins, just like we have here. You see how they got like one, two, three, uh, these various pins. You can write your own text on the map. Uh, you can do all sorts of fun things uh, with the map. And of course, that's really, really handy 
you know, if you're, let's say you want to build a store, a new store somewhere in St. Cloud, uh, being able to show it on a map like this, they will look, we're going to put it at, maybe these are, uh, what are these, 13 pins, maybe these are 13 different spots where you're thinking about putting in your uh, structure, right, your store, and the people there at the meeting could look at this and say, okay, there's that highway, uh, there's this lake or river there, <laughs> You know, it's just a lot easier to get a, a sense of uh, that location looking at a map like this. Uh, even if you had photographs of you might have some photographs that go with this. Uh, but this, I think the map, you know, the whole purpose of a map is to, is to give you that bird's eye, uh, big picture of view and, and see where it fits in. Uh, you, might, you might say like this uh, too, or really by the time you get here to 7, 8, 9, I mean, you can say, look, these are really close together. Do we really need another location uh, that close? Uh you can, you can sort of make judgments like that by eyeballing this map. It would be very hard to do just in text form. And moving on, we have the Ghent charts <laughs> showing timelines. Uh, and these, these kind of scare me a little bit. They, they get a little too close to home. I don't know what your schedule is like, but it seems like mine is just everything is overlapping. But and that's really the purpose of these Ghent charts. Uh, so you can see like where this overlaps. Uh, you can see ranges of times. Uh, so you might have a, my, I might do my office hours like this. And you could say, well, uh, when can I go to Matt's office? Let's see, maybe this is uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, right? And you could see these lines. You can see he's got, he's got hardly any office hours on this day. Here, it's just a little bit of a smidge. Uh, whereas this day, there's a big, long line. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, those. That's kind of this the whole idea of the Gantt chart, lets you overlap things. I'm trying to think of something besides a timeline uh, where this might be handy. <laughs> Not coming up with anything, maybe you can. Uh, when, when you might use a Gantt chart besides time. All right, now we're up to the conventions. These are the norms that guide these visuals. A uh, title that tells the story the visual shows uh, clear indications of what the data are, uh, clearly labeled units, labels or legends identifying axes, colors, symbols, etc. So again, looking at the map, if you've ever looked at a map, you know they have a, a little thing on there somewhere that tells you the, uh, the I forget what they call it, but the, like how many inches correspond to miles or how many miles correspond to an inch. So you know, if it's just a couple inches on the map, maybe that's 50 miles, maybe it's 100 miles, etc. Uh, so that's the idea. People won't just be able to look at a table or a graph and, and know what you're trying to tell them unless you label things, title things, uh, label, uh, maybe even have a separate thing called a legend there on the side that says, look, this symbol means such and such. This symbol means uh, such and such. Again, without, if you forget to put that on there, it's kind of useless because people don't even know what uh, what it is you're trying to tell them. And let's see, the source of data used to create the visual, oh yes. <laughs> and I've noticed this on TV. They used to not do this on, on the television news. They just show a chart. Uh, but I noticed now that at the bottom they have the, you know, where it came from. And sometimes they'll put the, uh, uh, what do they call it, the error margin of error on there. Uh, just some data to help you interpret that visual to see if you uh, think it's a reliable source or not. Yeah, I guess this is, uh, they say your source of visual, if not your work. And I guess that's the reason those news uh, shows are doing that, because they maybe it's a Pew, uh, maybe they're getting something from Pew Research. They didn't compile it, uh, so they'll put it on there. Or I notice sometimes uh, they'll be trying to be polemical or political about it, and they'll say, yeah, this is a CNN poll. <laughs> this is a, a Fox News poll. And they'll even put that on there to try to discredit them. All right, use color and decoration with restraint. And we, we talked about this a long time ago now, I guess, but this idea of colors, say, well, white means uh, good, it's happy, purity, whatever. And black is, means death. And we talked about how, and, well, you go to Japan, and that might be the opposite. And a lot of this is culturally based. Uh, of course, it's also uh, related to, to context. 
you think of red might mean the color of love in one context, but of course, if it's in the context of driving down the road, it means stop. <laughs> uh, color connotations may vary among cultures and professions, yes. Oh, here's some examples. I always love these. Oh, wow. Uh, so red means go in China. <laughs> stop in the U.S. <laughs> so they, that's interesting. Uh, I did not know that. So I guess in China, the traffic lights are, must pretty much be the opposite. <laughs> that, that's got to be fun if you uh, go to China and try to drive. Uh, let's see. Blue equals masculinity in the U.S. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Boys, I don't know if they, people still do this, but uh, when I was a kid, you know, somebody's having a baby boy, they'd, everything would be blue, uh, pink for girls. Uh, let's see, criminality in France, uh, blue means criminality in France, okay. <laughs> uh, strength and fertility in Egypt. Oh, that's, that's, this is all really interesting stuff, you know. I, I don't know about you, I just find it fascinating how these, you think, well, everybody looks, everybody sees the same color, right? But yeah, but they might interpret it uh, very different ways. It's really interesting. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, use minimum shading and lines. If you get too much stuff going on in your chart, it gets to be too confusing and it becomes useless. If you, you know, I see this all the time. Again, the, the pie chart with 50 slices, it's not helpful. Uh, if you need more than like five or six slices, it's probably better just to go with something else or try to leave off. Maybe have two or three pie charts, not just one, trying to do everything. Uh, let's see, for black and white graphs, use shades of gray. Uh, so for this one, it's probably not so relevant these days because we're, everything is digital. And it's no big deal to have a color chart. But, you know, every now and then you'll find yourself limited to black and white. And so, of course, they wouldn't be able to see a red and a green line, uh, a red and green pie slices. So you have to get into, like, this, uh, the little textured slice so you have like one with little v's on it one with little slices on it one with dots <laughs> polka dots etc um they say use shades of gray i guess that could be fine but i just uh, for me it doesn't really work because it quickly gets to where you can't really see the differences in those shades uh, i think the textures are better and sorry about all this beeping on this computer i don't know what's going on uh, with that <laughs> All right, be sure visual is accurate and ethical. Um, again, there's lots and lots of ways to mislead with charts. We talked about this several times at this point. All right, make sure your audience does not have to study the visual to learn the main point. Uh, so this, I guess they're talking here, this probably has more to do with uh, differently abled people. You know, if somebody's... Uh, can't see uh, the text uh, or the picture it's very they could read the text probably have that read to them or braille or whatever they're they're using a screen reader uh, but it might stumble with that photograph that's uh, something to know if they have to see the photo to be able to figure it out that that's a problem uh, distinguish between actual and, and estimated or projected values all right this would be spelled out in the text you might say these are the actual values. Uh, here's what we're expecting over that's going to happen next year. Uh, but if that's not clear, uh, it might be confusing or again unethical. You can say, look, here's what here's the profits we're projecting <laughs> for next year. <laughs> you see that you think, wow, let me invest, not realizing those are just projected values. Uh, include the context of the data, right? How was it collected? Who is it collected from, etc. Um, avoid perspective in 3D graphs. So I don't really see too many people doing this. Uh, every now and then I'll have a student that's, that's on PowerPoint and they say, why, not, why do just a regular old pie chart or line graph when you got all these 3D options? You can sort of have this isometric thing going on and everything's got, <laughs> looks like it's out of the movie Tron or something. And you say, yeah, that looks, that looks really cool, but does it make it clearer? Uh, does it make it easier to parse that data? And it's usually no. So just kind of stay away from it. Uh, avoid combining with multiple scales. Yeah, that should just, the scales, you can think about that, those maps, 
again, where some on some maps, maybe an inch is a couple of miles, maybe it's 100 miles, 1,000 miles. If you just have it all combined together, that's just going to be, you know, it's going to be completely confusing. It won't be able to make any sense of it. And then uh, using images that are bias-free. We talked about this. I forget when we were talking about this. But a lot of times you might say, uh, well, I want to have some people in this. I want to have a little photograph of some people using the product, uh, maybe some of our clients and customers. And you get into this idea of, uh, well, let's look. Uh, is everybody here in the photograph white guys? Uh, that, that could be biased, right? You might say, we need a more representative sample. But we'll give this... Uh, get the wrong idea here right you can think about uh, uh, diagrams too and drawings right and, uh, you know one of the things i notice even today it seems like whenever there's a commercial on for some kind of cleaning product uh, they just show women and you, you just never see a guy every now and then there'll be an exception to this but uh, usually it's just all uh, women using these cleaning products and i think that could be a little biased you know they probably should make a point of having some uh, there's some men using those products, too, just to avoid that issue. Well, as integrating uh, visuals into your text, uh, this is probably the most important thing. Is that, again, you're not using visuals for decoration. They need to serve some kind of purpose. Uh, and they need to pertain somehow to what you're, talk, you're writing about. So they say refer to every visual uh, in the text. Uh, refer to the table or figure number, not the title. So really important, and I hope you're doing this in your uh, sample chapters. Uh, you'd have a photograph, a table, whatever it is, and you always have a thing down here that says figure 2.3. Figure, uh, let's just say it's chapter 1, image 3. So it'd be one, figure 1 1.3. And that's labeled here like fig dot 1.3. say. And then in your paragraph somewhere here, you'd say uh, blah, 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 see figure 1.3. Right, so that you're referring back to this particular figure in the text. Oh, here's some examples. Right, so Table 10 shows a detailed comparison. Uh, data in Figure 6 reveals a marked trend. So they, you don't just say see picture on this page. <laughs> you say figure see Figure 6. Because uh, sometimes uh, when they're doing the actual printing on this and doing the layouts, uh, this figure might end up on a different page. It's not like this has happened to me many times. It's not like I wanted that. It's just by the time they put the text out there and arranged everything, maybe there just wasn't any room, so they had to move this figure over to the next page. If I just say see figure, you don't know if I'm talking about something on this page, the next page, whatever. It's completely confusing. If I say see figure six, uh, then you can say, well, I don't see figure six on this page. Uh, turn the page. Oh, there's figure six. <laughs> <laughs> oh, success. <laughs> uh, put visual as soon after the reference as space and page design permit. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, it's great if figure six is on the page. But, again, sometimes there's not enough room for it. Sometimes it's a big table. Uh, a big graph might not fit. You, know, you have to move it. Um, so, yeah, and, and ideally it would be close, but sometimes you have to move a couple pages around. It's annoying, but again, we live in a world called reality. <laughs> you know, if it's a page, you just don't have infinite space on a piece of paper. On a website, you know, of course, you can do that. So we see, as figure three shows, page 10. Uh, see table two on page 14. Right? You might have to do something like this. Let's see a little bit more on this, and then we're done. Uh, so summarize the main point of the visual before. Uh, the visual itself, right? So what is the point of that visual? What is it trying to get across? You got to put that into words. And they say uh, the amount of discussion uh, depends on the audience, complexity of the visual, and importance of the point. So with the on the airline brochures, you know, it's just going to tell you probably the steps. They'll have the steps written out in text form, uh, probably along the bottom or at the top of the image. And of course, it's really important. Uh, so they, they had to make sure that their text uh, spells out whatever's happening in that photo. Usually it's not a very complex photo, but, you know, if it is, of course, they'd have to spend more time uh, describing it. And then after that visual, they evaluate the data, discuss its implications. And this kind of ties into that point we've been coming back to again and again. I mean, these, these visuals are there for a reason. 
Uh, they're there to help you to elucidate points, to identify trends, uh, to emphasize things. You want to discuss it, uh, use that as the springboard for the uh, discussion. <laughs> Weak. Listed below are their results. Uh, better. As figure four shows, uh, sales doubled in the last decade. So this is good because they've, they said figure four. They didn't just say listed below because we don't even know if they are below. They could have ended up on a different page. Uh, so this is garbage. Uh, this one, you got the label there, figure four. And then they tell you a little something about it, right? So, you know, why do we put this there? Well, it shows how the sales doubled in the last decade. All right, I think that will do it for this uh, lecture. If you do have questions or comments, so please let me know. Happy to answer those. And hope you enjoyed this and see you next time.